Lori Wine, it's Pastor Allen here again from All Saints Lutheran Church with the message for November the 22nd, 2020. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark, which I've entitled The Remarkable Gospel. And I don't know about you, but I have certainly found this journey in the Gospel of Mark to be very remarkable. It, uh, it's actually quite astounding that I've been myself impacted by uh, what I've been researching, studying, and uh, preparing f- to share with you. And uh, of course, if you have any comments or questions, don't be shy, but email me at pastor at allsaintslutheran.ca, and I'll do my best to answer whatever questions or concerns you might have. Uh, In this week's uh, message, someone else is astounded. He marvels, and you might be surprised who that is and why, and I'm going to try to share that with you. We're getting near to the end of the series. After this message, we have two more weeks to go, God willing. And uh, then we'll see what we're, we're going to be doing from there. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to read our passage, Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. Often I read a little more, either before or after or both, but this week I'm simply going to read those 20 verses. Mark 15, 1 through 20. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple robe, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Let's pray. Father, these are troubling words, but I believe that you have some, some things that you want us to hear through this message. Please help me as I share some of the things I believe you shared with me, that we all might get to know you better and be more equipped to face the challenges that we need to face in our lives at this time. We look to you, Lord. Glorify your name. Thank you for what your Son has done on our behalf, that we might be your children and live for you, and live for you in these days. Please, Help us all, in Jesus' name. Amen. So last time we looked at what was a a trial before the, the people who were the main community leaders, the main Jewish community leaders in the land of Israel, uh, which were the the this council, which the special word for that is Sanhedrin, and they looked for a way to. To get hold of Jesus and then they interrogated him and nobody could really come and say anything to incriminate him until finally the the high priest directly asked him about his identity and he invoked two scriptural passages Psalm 110 and Daniel chapter 7 to claim that he was the divine messenger who was going to rule and last time I, I entitled it who's on trial because here was uh, under the romans the high priest was 
very, very powerful, had so much control over the Jewish people's lives, and he believed he, he held Jesus' Jesus's life in his hands when actually he was standing before the author of life himself and did not know it. But of course, not believing that Jesus was this divine son of man from Daniel 7, uh, he reasonably, within his, his misguided understanding, um, said he was worthy of death. But the, the Jewish community in the land of Israel at that time did not have the right to execute people. So they had to somehow get the state, that is the, the Roman authorities, the, the Roman people were the, in the Roman Empire, they were, uh, had control of the whole land of Israel, including this area in the south uh, called Judea. And the governor at that time was Pontius Pilate. And they had to figure out a way to get Pilate to uh, agree to execute him. And so that's where we pick up the story. Verse 1 of chapter 15, the first half. And as, as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. So they had decided, this is the Jewish ruling council in Jerusalem decided that they had enough, they had enough uh, reason to put him to death, but they had to come up with a plan. How would they convince Pilate, the Roman authority, to execute him? And so they came up with a plan in the second half of verse 1, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And so this idea of taking him and giving him over to the ruling authorities in the land. Now, when we look at some of the details in this passage, what a lot of people want to do is they, they think that the objective of studying Scripture is to figure out what really happened. And so they'll go to the other gospel writings and, and see the, all the various details, and they'll try to put it together like a puzzle to figure out what really happened. Now, we know what happened. We know all the main things that happened. In the different Gospels, they are described in different ways. But as I've been trying to share in these weeks, is that the Holy Spirit guided, possibly it was Peter who, who spoke these words originally, this told the story orally in public, and then Mark eventually wrote it down. And through this writing, God is seeking to speak to us or teach us particular things. And so I'm most concerned to see how the story of Jesus here is being told to us and try to understand what it is God, through Mark's writings, is trying, is trying to teach us. So we need to get, we need to get the point, God's point in what we are reading here. Verse 2, And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And so this is the big question. The reference to the king of the Jews comes up five times in Mark chapter 15. And king of Israel, referring to Jesus, but always in a facetious sort of way, it comes up once. And this is a very key concept for, for Pilate. Now, of course, the, the religious authorities did not believe that Jesus was their true king. But it seems that this is the charge that they brought to Pilate, because most of their concerns, we would call them religious or biblical, things that the, the priesthood would be concerned about, um, finding ways from their perspective to get rid of him, to put him to death. But their concerns are not the concerns that Pilate would have, and it's possible that this was what they were discussing. They realized that if they, if they charge him with saying that he's the king of the Jews, Pilate would be compelled to treat him uh, as somebody who's committing treason, trying to usurp Caesar as the true king over the, over the land of Israel. And so th this would be something that Pilate should be concerned about. And, if, and he mentions it several times. Uh, and we're going to see that Pilate knows that they don't really believe this, and he he kind of taunts them in how he interacts with them and, and is mocking them and the Jewish people by, by using this title, the King of the Jews. Now, of course, it's ironic because Jesus really is the King of the Jews. That's what Messiah means. The long-awaited Messiah was to be 
Israel's king. That's exactly who he, who he was. Um, and so he asks him this, are you the king of the Jews? And, and Jesus answers him and says, and he answered him, you have said so. In the Greek, it's something like you say. And it's very difficult to know what Jesus' intention is by saying you say. So some take it to mean that's what you're saying, um, but I'm not saying that. Now, of course, he is that. So others think that what he's saying is, you, like, it's you got it, Pilate. You, you hit the nail on the head. You know exactly who I am. But it, it seems to me what's going on here is he gives a very ambig, ambiguous answer. Because, of course, Pilate said the truth. But Pilate, by, the, the accusation is true. But Pilate didn't believe that. And the, the religious leaders didn't believe that. But it was true. Also, it would be, if he would assert his kingship, kingship, it, it would create a, a very different kind of dynamic. What's, what's going on here is like, Jesus is, is a, a, I was going to say, was, is living in a different world, but actually Jesus is living in the real world. Everybody else doesn't understand what's going on. They don't really understand what life is all about. That's partly what Jesus came to do, was to teach us what God's really like, and what life is really like. And so what he's doing here he, is he's being confronted by illegitimate world power. Now, on one hand, Pilate is a legitimate ruler, and we're encouraged in Scripture to obey authorities. But the Roman rulership saw themselves as, as divine. Caesar believed he was a god. People would worship Caesar. And so they had gone beyond anything that was truly legitimate. And here was Pilate before the true king of not only Israel, but of the universe. And, and, and similar to being before the high priest that we looked at last time, who's really on trial here? You know, Pilate thinks he's in control. But actually, he, uh, he's, he's the one who's being judged, so to speak. Jesus had come to establish the kingdom of God, and earthly power doesn't know what to do with that. And so this, this interchange between Pilate and, and Jesus with this simple answer of, you say, causes the, the chief priest to, to, to react. Verse 3, and the chief priest accused him of many things. So they start talking and they start firing accusations toward him. Verse 4, and Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? Now, we're not told what they're accusing him of. They might have brought up some of their more uh, religious concerns, the, their more personal concerns about him claiming to be the Jewish Messiah. Uh, maybe they were saying he was he was doing magic by doing these miracles because they didn't really believe he was deriving power from God. But none of these were of, of concern to Pilate. The only real concern to Pilate is that was he a political upstart trying to, to lead an insurrection, claiming to be Israel's king, when the Romans would uh, not tolerate any of that whatsoever. But Jesus doesn't have anything to say here. The, the charges against him are, are bogus. He, he, he doesn't have much to say to Pilate. Remember, in his, while Jesus was the true king of Israel, the true king of the Jews, uh, he didn't portray himself in that way. He, he established that through implication, through his teachings, through the signs and wonders that he was doing, but it was not time to, to overthrow the powers of evil. That's going to come later when he returns, when he comes to judge the, the whole earth and everyone will have to give an account to him. He had come to, to allow himself, I was going to say he's going to confront evil, but he's actually allowing evil to confront him. He's going to allow evil to have its way so he can turn the world in a sense inside out and through evil doing its worst against Jesus, he's going to use that to bring about the remarkable forgiveness of sins. Now, nobody here really in this story knows about this. Of course, even his followers don't fully understand that. And I wonder how much we really understand that. Uh, but we need to see what he's doing and how he's functioning as the true king of the Jews to really understand what it means to follow him. So, so let's go on. So Pilate expected him to defend himself in some way because whether, well, the accusations were probably ludicrous. He hadn't done the things that they're claiming that, that 
they're saying that he did. And so how does Jesus respond? Verse 5, but Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now, we're supposed to notice this. If Pilate was amazed, then this must be something to notice. All through the Gospel of Mark, people are amazed. They're overwhelmed. They're astounded. The disciples are. The crowds are. Even Jesus is. And here, the representative of the world power of the day is standing before the, the king of the Jews. He doesn't really believe that. And through how Jesus is handling the situation, Pilate is amazed. But what is there to be amazed about? He's encountering true power. He, do, he, he has the sword at, at his disposal. He can, he can decide, that Jesus, which he will, to, that he would be crucified. He thinks the whole world is, is at his disposal, and because of the name of Caesar, they could do whatever he wants, but he's standing before true power, and he doesn't know how to handle it. What the world believes power is all about is taking control through force by asserting yourself. And there, there's a time to assert yourself, and Jesus asserted himself. There was a time when he, when, he, when he spoke, and he taught, and he confronted. He confronted the Sanhedrin by by proclaiming that the whole temple system had been corrupt and this is one of the reasons why they wanted to kill him there was a time to speak up but he knew that this was not that time and how did he know that he knew that because he was operating under a completely different system than the powers of this world operate he was not self-driven he was not politically driven he was affecting the politics of the day because here he is confronting worldly powers, the religious powers, this we might call the secular powers, the state. And he was working out the will of God in, in a way that was driving everybody crazy because he was following his father's will even if it would kill him. And the world says, no, no, you're not supposed to do it that way. Pilate understood power. And here he was in the in the in the presence of real power, and it overwhelmed him. Let's go on. Verse 6. Now at the feast, it's the Passover feast, remember, and there's large crowds in Jerusalem for Passover. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. The way it's referring to the insurrection, it sounds like everyone who's hearing this is supposed to know that there was an attempt to overthrow uh, the Roman government. And one of the people involved in that who had actually committed murder in the insurrection is this man named Barabbas, and he's he was arrested. And it appears there was a custom that the, that the Roman governor would pardon a, a criminal. And because Barabbas was involved in trying to overthrow the government. He was a political prisoner. That was the crime that crucifixion was for. Crucifixion was for political crimes. They're also for slaves. Slaves who needed to be, who they deemed they had to be executed, they be executed through crucifixion and, and insurrections, people trying to overthrow the government. And so that's the kind of of sentence that Jesus would be facing. It's the kind of sentence that Barabbas would be facing. And when we see this, though we read it as, oh, what horrible people they are that that here, uh, here's this precious man, this teacher rabbi who went around doing such good, and now, and there's this hardened criminal murderer in prison, and the crowds are gonna ask for the hardened criminal instead of the precious son of God. That's how we tell the story today, but I don't know if, if that's how the story should be told. I don't know if that's really what's going on here. That, that It's there to some extent. Like in the layers of this story, it's there, and it does it, it reflect the, the nature of human beings that we would want to trade off uh, the Son of God, I'm supposed to say that, for a, for a, a murderer? Well, you need to be careful, though, when we start thinking this way about thinking about how terrible those people are. I've said this before. We're being told how how terrible they are as a mirror to see ourselves. 
Oh, he would never do such a thing. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't really know if that's true. When we're in these kinds of situations, no telling how our evil hearts could lead us down some very terrible roads. But again, I don't know if, if this is being told to us so much to show us how terrible people are. That there's something else going on here. What's going on here by being presented with the king of the Jews, the rightful king of the Jews, contrasted with Barabbas, who was trying to overthrow the government through, through violent means, what's being presented to us is two choices. What kind of king do you want? Do you want the, 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 the hero on this, with the sword on the white horse chopping off people's heads with, through, through, through violence and other means? Or do we want the Jesus kind of king? And again, it's not, this is not Jesus meek and mild. This is Jesus brave and true willing to do whatever it takes to rescue people from their sin, to deliver his people from oppression, to lead people in, in serving the kingdom of God and its values all over the world. He's, brief, he's, he's, he's seeking to train his people to be brave, courageous, be willing to die on behalf of the kingdom. So what kind of, what kind of king do we really want? And what, so what's happening here is the people of that day, they don't want that kind of king. Even his own disciples fled. Remember that. When he was doing the will of God that was clarified for him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and his disciples, the closest to him, they would fall asleep. They were not wrestling with God in prayer like he was. And he had become clear before his Father in heaven what he was to do. And he was now doing the will of God. Everybody ran away. And now the religious leaders, they want Barabbas. They don't want Jesus because we don't want that kind of king. And so then we lose out because that's the only king we're going to get. Because when God is king, it's Jesus. Verse 8, And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And of course, he doesn't really believe that. He knows they don't really believe that. And he says, verse, it says here, verse 10, for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. You know, political people understand political people. He's reading right through these, these uh, religious leaders. And he sees they're not concerned that, that, he's, that, that Jesus is, is uh, an upstart, phony king. He sees that they just want to get rid of him for their own reasons and own purposes, and that they're trying to play him uh, to, um, to, to do their bidding, which of course he ends up doing. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, so he knows really what, uh, what they're doing, and yet he's egging them on by continuing to call him the king of the Jews as if he really is their king. Verse 11, but the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And by the way, we're not told who this crowd is. Um, there were thousands of people in Jerusalem at the time, and wherever they were would not be able to have thousands of people. It's not like all the people that came or Passover, all those people that welcome Jesus into the city shouting, Hoshiana, Ben David, Hosanna to the son of David. It's not as if all those people um, are now there crying out for him to be crucified. These seem to be a, cr a crowd of people that have aligned one way or another for whatever reason with the priesthood, the, the people who were worried the most about, uh, about Jesus' work, who wanted to get rid of him. It's th they, this crowd seems to be in cahoots with the priests, um, and which is what a lot of people do. We are always pick we're picking sides, we're picking sides. And again, the status quo, the idea that somebody's coming to change things, for, for many of us, that's the worst thing at all. And we, and we start to act out in strange ways when we're threatened by change. And, um, and so the chief priests stir up this crowd to have them release Barabbas instead. Verse 12, And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Again, he's mocking them. He's egging them on. They don't really believe he's their king. He is. 
but they don't believe that. So he's goading them. He's, he's, he's poking at them. Verse 13, and they cried out again. And we don't, it's, it could be the priests. It could be the crowd. It could be the priests and the crowd. Crucify him. Again, this sounds to us like bloodthirsty people. But remember, Roman crucifixion was the sentence for, um, for treason. And so that's what they are asking for because they don't want him as the as to, they don't want him as their king. And he knows that that's the only worthy sentence that Pilate would be able to to in, to do for that charge. And Pilate said to them, "Why? What evil has he done?" And they shouted all the more, "Crucify him!" And uh, this reminds me of some of the anger that we're seeing today. Uh, in our streets, people reacting to situations, whether they're, they're worthy causes or not worthy causes. People um, are so frustrated, they're confused. They're, I, I believe people are very misguided today. We've, we've lost a, a, a foundation of, of reason and proper understanding of life. And, it's, and really, this is the sort of thing that happens all over the world. When things are not going the way people want, they begin to spew out venom. People! Not just these people, people, not just, it's, it's us too. If without the Lord's help, we become just like this. And if we don't believe that, we're missing something. All right, verse 16, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, salute him Hail, King of the Jews! By, by mocking Jesus as king of the Jews, these soldiers, this large group of soldiers, are, are mocking the Jewish people. They hated the people of Israel. And this gave them an opportunity to unleash their venom on the chosen people of God and, and uh, upon God himself, because here's God's representative. God had become a man in Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man, and and they're they're mocking everything that is good everything that would benefit them but they are so misguided and there's an interesting allusion here to the story of, of abraham offering up isaac as you know god called abraham to offer up his child that was not ultimately god's plan he had he had other other plans but abraham was willing to obey god at the last minute an angel stops Abraham from doing it and draws his attention to a ram that is in a thorn bush, a thicket. And the, the ram had its horns stuck in the thorns. And so now we have the Lamb of God with his head stuck in the thorns. And it's, there's so much irony here. So in the mockery, there's the, the message of what God is actually doing here in and through Jesus. Verse 19, and they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his clothes on him and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. There's t you know, there's such terrible suffering that Jesus is experiencing here. And um, we often think of and we're right to do this. We're right to think of the depths of love that he had for us, that he'd be willing to suffer to this extent, to take upon himself our sins so that we could be forgiven. But through all this, we need to see the depths of evil that he was allowing himself to endure. I, I forgot to mention in, in the verse that it appears, I'm pointing here because that's where my notes are, uh, that Pilate had command him to be scourged that was the no being scourged was the normal prelude to being crucified where they would whip the victim uh the the condemned person they would whip him um and these whips were made of leather and they'd often have pieces of metal and bone embedded in the in the leather and so the person would be whipped and their their skin would be torn it was horrible 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 and then this mockery and the putting on of a, of one taking off of one uh, um, they put on one cloak and then and then taking it off, putting on another, and with the blood and the skin, it was horrible, horrible, horrible. But we're not just to see the depths of love. That we need to see the depths of love that he was expressing on our behalf, but we need to see the depths of evil. 
when God comes to visit human beings, this is how people treated him. This is not about the Jews. This is not about the Romans. They were the chosen players in this story. This is about human beings, whether it's the people, religious leaders, uh, uh, this, the state leaders. This is what people do to God. And, and it's not they. It's what we do to God every day. That's why we need His salvation. Because we don't want to do what God wants us to do and we want to get rid of God. We want to push Him out of our lives. And as believers, it can be worse. Because we pick, we can pick and choose what we want and we like, and we then we, we we push away the other things. So we need to come back to that question: What kind of king do we want? Do we want a Barabbas-style king, the kind of person that's just going to take charge and lead, you know, fight our battles for us? That's one of the interesting things about following Jesus. We need to follow Jesus. We don't sit back and just watch him save the day. There is an aspect where there's things that he does that we cannot do, but he's calling us to follow him, to join him in his mission. And if we're not following him in his mission, we're not following him at all, because that's what following him means. So do we want the kind of king that's just going to, he's going to use violent means, he's going to use aggression, he's just going to make things happen, or are we going to follow the kind of king that's going to listen to the voice of the Father and lead us in God's good will. A, a life that's a, a reliant kind of life, not a take charge kind of life. A, a, a life that's willing to give ourselves e even to the evil when necessary so that good will have its way. And one more thing in this remarkable gospel, and I mentioned it earlier, how God takes human evil that his son subjected himself to and uses it that we would be accepted by God. That he was willing to face the most horrific evil and leverage it for good for us. Then are we willing to live the same way that others would be so blessed as we are? Are we willing to face great difficulty? Or are we going to hide away from it? What's still ringing in my ears from last time is, it's, is when it says that Peter followed, when Jesus was rested from the Garden of Gethsemane, it says that Peter followed him at a distance. And then Peter ends up denying him three times. Praise God, God restored Peter back to himself. But when we're following at a distance, we might find ourselves getting further and further away. We need to draw close to the Lord now more than ever before and look to Him and for Him for strength and Him for grace and Him for forgiveness that we would follow Him in the way we all need to at this time. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the great depths that your Son um, has gone to, that we might be your children. Help us to be willing to be taken to similar depths. We don't pay for anybody's sins, but there's still so much evil in the world, a world that wants to, to reject you. And you've called us to follow the rejected one. And yet we're so afraid of being rejected ourselves. Father, your Son made so clear that if we seek to save our lives, we'll lose them. But if we're willing to lose our lives for his sake and for the sake of the gospel, we will find our lives. Help us, Lord, at this time to find our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Again, please, any questions, concerns, comments, please email me at pastor at allsaintslutheran.ca. Until next time, this is Pastor Allen. God bless you all.